Hi everyone, this video is about statistical analysis and data interpretation for AP Psychology students. It falls in the Unit 0 series about science practices and is the second part of the statistical analysis videos. This particular video will cover measures of variation in inferential statistics. To begin, here are the three key focuses of this particular video. By the end, you should be able to answer the following questions. How can measures of variation summarize a data set? How does percentile rank help us describe data points? And how can we determine the extent to which observed differences can be generalized to other populations? These are the essential concepts that are related to statistical analysis and data interpretation. As you can see, some are bolded and some are not. The terms that are bolded will be covered in this video called 7.2. The terms that are not bolded were covered in the previous video called 7.1, but altogether these make up the concepts that students should know as they relate to making sense of research findings and the data that's collected. If you would like to see an entire list of skills that students need to be able to do as it relates to data interpretation and statistical analysis, you can pause the video. I will cover the remainder of those skills in this video. So let's continue on with making sense of research data using descriptive statistics. Now we will focus on measures of variation. So you can see that there are two measurement tools on this particular set of data. We have range and standard deviation, and both of these are considered measures of variation. And measures of variation help us understand how spread apart or dispersed our data set is. And I imagine you're likely familiar with range already, which is the distance between the highest score and the lowest score in a data set. And unlike median or mean or mode and range, I imagine you are less familiar with standard deviation, but I do want you to know that what you will have to do is be able to understand standard deviation and not necessarily calculate it. So go ahead and pause the video and determine range if you haven't already. So from this data set, you should have found that the difference between 10 and 1 is 9. So 9 is our range, which is the difference between the highest and lowest score. And as I said, you won't be calculating standard deviation, but you will want to know what it is, how it works, what its purpose is, and what it can really tell us about a data set. Standard deviation, like range, is a tool that helps us describe and understand the variation of our data set. This particular tool helps us understand how spread apart our data points are from one another and from the mean, and it indicates how close our values are to one another or how spread apart they are. If your standard deviation is high, then that means that your numbers are likely very spread apart. And if your standard deviation is low, that means your numbers are more closely compact to one another. So for example, if you had two companies that had the same average salary, but one had a high standard deviation of salaries at that company, that likely means that the salaries there are really spread apart. Whereas if you had a low standard deviation, that, that means that they're probably closer together and more closely are compact around the mean. So standard deviation can be really helpful and you use a formula that helps you consider all of those values and the mean in the data set and it involves adding up the squared differences between each value and the mean and then taking the square root of that particular sum, but it's not something that you are going to need to calculate as AP Psychology students, but rather you should just know what standard deviation means and how it can help us better understand our data set, as well as how does it look and visually what can it tell us on a distribution curve. Now let's think about standard deviation, how it would look visually when plotted. So what you can see here is a distribution curve and you can see that psychologists have collected a data set and this is spanning from 52 to 149 and you can see that across the X axis. And this data is coming from a collection of IQ test scores and you can see the height of each of the bars are representing the number of people that got each of those scores. And as you previously learned in in video 7.1, a normal curve is when your mean, median, and mode are all falling around the center, and then you have fewer um, out here on the high and low ends. And you can see visually on this particular distribution that 100 is the median in the middle and the mode, the number that occurs most often. So we've learned so far in summary statistics like mean, median, mode, and range, they help us understand our data set. So let's use this example here and let's use this one to learn more about what standard deviation can tell us. Okay, so we have our same example of IQ scores. 
we still have that normal distribution curve, but now it's divided into equal sections. This is our standard deviation. So in relation to our IQ assessment, standard deviation is 15 points. So if you look across the x-axis, you can see that there are three defined sections to the right of the mean and three defined sections to the left of the mean, and those represent our 15 point standard deviation spread in our data set. And because our normal curve shows that most of our data is actually falling right around our mean, what this means is that in any typical normal curve data distribution, 68% of the data set will be one standard deviation above or below the mean. And what that means for IQ here is that uh, 85 points to 115 points is one standard deviation above and below the mean, and that represents 68% of the data point. Now, you can also see that 95% of our data is falling within two standard deviations above and below the mean. And this in IQ is representing, you can see here, a score of 70 to a score of 130. And then in all data sets, always the same, 99.7% of the data is going to fall at least three standard deviations above and below the mean. And what this means for us, not only does it help us understand how spread apart our data is as a whole, but it also can help us understand a single data point. For example, if a student scored 120 on the IQ assessment, and I know that my spread, uh, my standard deviation is 15 points, then what I can conclude is that 120 on the IQ test is two standard deviations above the mean. What standard deviation does for us, as I mentioned, is it can help us understand our spread and our data set, and it can also be a good indicator of a data point and its relation to the mean. So notice these two distributions of data. You can see that each distribution is divided into those six equal sections, three above the mean and three below the mean. But visually, you can tell that the standard deviation is different. In the first set, you can see that it's smaller, which represents that all of the values in the data set are closer together. Whereas you can see in the second distribution, the standard deviation is larger, which represents that the data set itself is more spread apart. Another way we can talk about data points is by using percentile rank. Now, percentile rank is not a measure of central, central tendency, and it's not a measure of variation. Instead, it's just a way to summarize a single data point in relation to the other data points in the distribution. The percentile rank can indicate the percentage of scores that fall below a specific score in the data set. For example, if a student's score is in the 86th percentile, what that means is that this student's score is higher than 86% of the other data points in that set. So percentile rank provides context about the position of a specific score relative to the entire distribution of scores. So you may remember from the beginning of video 7.1, I shared the difference between descriptive and inferential statistics. Descriptive statistics are summaries that we can make about the data we collected in a study. However, inferential statistics can be made if that is a sample that is representative of a whole population. So one thing that we need to keep in mind is that inferential statistics, when we're making summaries from samples that are representative of a whole, they can be generalized to a larger population. So generalizability is an important concept. It refers to the extent to which the findings can be applied or extended to the larger population. And here are a few things that can ensure that your research findings can be generalized. First is using a large sample. And then also equally important is that that large sample is representative, meaning it's a diverse sample representing the multiple characteristics of that population, as well as the use of random sampling and replication. All of those factors can ensure that the research findings can be generalizable. The remaining concepts in this video will relate to inferential statistics, which are summaries we can make about a representative sample when they represent a larger population. 
So when the group that I'm studying is a random representative sample, then I can make those conclusions based on my sample and I can generalize them to a larger population. These are called inferential statistics. And here are two concepts that relate to inferential statistics. The first is statistical significance and statistical significance is measured in a p-value. And this is just another measurement tool that you're not going to have to calculate for the AP psychology exam, but you'll need to know what it means. So statistical significance determines whether the observed effect in the study is likely due to chance or is unlikely due to chance. It helps the researcher decide if the results can be trusted and reflect true the true effect in the broader population and it suggests whether the observed effect is unlikely to have just occurred by random chance so if it's statistically significant then it is unlikely that the results are just due to chance another important concept regarding inferential statistics is the effect size and the effect size helps us understand how big or important the results are um, beyond just whether they are statistically significant so here's an example of how to explain effect size imagine you're comparing two groups boys and girls and there is a large effect size that means that there is a noticeable enough difference that there is a large enough difference in the results between boys and girls and if the effect size is small then that means that the difference between the results is just not very noticeable so effect size just helps us make general judgments about whether the results are a big deal or just a small difference. It's like looking at how much of an impact something has just beyond saying that there is an impact. So in summary, statistical significance tells you if the difference or the relationship is likely to be real and not due to chance. And then the effect size tells you how big or important the difference or the relationship is in the results of the study. So before closing out this video, let's stop and do a quick check for understanding. Remember, when we do these review questions, I'll read the, the question out loud and you'll need to pause the video to determine the answer. The correct answers will be displayed at the end of the video. In a normal distribution, what percentage of the scores in the distribution falls within one standard deviation on either side of the mean? Kai scored in the 90th percentile in a math competition in her state. Which of the following statements is true of Kai's score? This concludes video 7.2, Statistical Analysis and Data Interpretation in the Science Practices series for AP Psychology students. Be sure to check your answers to the multiple choice questions. And before you close out, check to see if you can answer the questions on the right hand of the screen and define the bolded concepts.